So this morning we are going to consider the recent work by Dr. Carl Jung on the subject of flying saucers. As you may have noted in the newspapers a few months back, uh, Dr. Jung was quoted as being a believer in the reality of flying saucers. As a result of his statement, uh, which he later declared to have been somewhat incorrect, he, uh, he prepared, apparently, or at least advanced as rapidly as possible, the publication of a small book devoted to his actual beliefs about this subject. And at the beginning of the book, Dr. Jung makes a very simple and definite statement, namely to the effect that he joins many others of uh, scientific mind and concurs with the experiences of a great number of individuals, namely that these persons, these authorities, uh, these researchers prove conclusively that man has seen something. Exactly what he has seen, Dr. Young declares himself to be totally unable to announce or report. He therefore takes the position that he believes that some type of phenomenon exists. He is not satisfied, however, that up to the present time, we are in a position to dogmatically diagnose the various findings that have been reported. Furthermore, for his purposes, he points out that the exact nature of the flying saucer is not his field of interest. His field of interest is the human reaction to the phenomena. His field of interest is an effort to understand the complex working of man's interior life as this is revealed through saucer phenomena. And although the work is of no great size, that is his little book, he has come to a number of rather interesting conclusions that continue to convey to us the thoughtfulness of the man himself and the fact that he is continuously seeking new knowledge bearing upon man's reactions to the unknown. He has pointed out in many of his works that the human being in the presence of a mystery is at a peculiar psychological disadvantage. But while at disadvantage, he is at the same time a most self-revealing creature, for his reaction to mystery tells us a great deal about the individual himself. Jung also calls to our attention that there is comparatively little rational bridging between man's reaction to circumstances and these circumstances themselves. So far as a circumstance is difficult to understand, to that degree it becomes a psychic factor in the personality of the individual. And this psychic factor may or may not have any direct bearing upon facts. Uh, outside of his work, but following his thinking, we may pause for a moment uh, to consider, for example, another group of mysterious circumstances, those attendant upon the performance of a stage conjurer. In the old days when parlor magic leisure domain and things of that kind were very popular and audiences spent a great deal of time and money to be entertained by men like Harry Houdini, Howard Thurston, Harry Keller, Alexander Herman. 
the audience gathered for one real purpose. They gathered to be amazed. They wanted to be fooled. They hoped that the performance would be smooth enough and capable enough so that they would not discover the correct answer. This audience was protected, however, psychologically, by a very simple fact held in common. The audience knew, as a group, that the work was done by some kind of trickery, that it was done by the uh, hand being quicker than the eye, that it was done by means of expensive and intricately devised equipment, so that these tricks were largely manually or technically um, equipment or devices suitable for the performance. They therefore uh, sat back in their chairs and enjoyed it. Yet every person who has been a professional in the field will bear witness to the fact that a certain percentage of the audience, perhaps not a large percent, refuse to accept the mechanical explanation. Stage conjurers have received letters and have been called upon repeatedly by persons who are convinced that these magicians actually possess supernatural power. Now this has a bearing on our subject in this way. The individual in the presence of a mystery must either take recourse in certain fact-finding concepts within himself or else detach himself from these facts and fall into a kind of mystery a mystery which perhaps he refuses to accept as a merely mechanical production. Each effect seen at such a performance has at least two explanations, one in mystery, wonderment, and the other in the quiet realization of technical means by which these effects are produced. Thus, as Jung points out in his book, a situation, condition, or object seen is susceptible of more than one interpretation. And our particular interest in the flying saucer problem, as he presents it, is the interpretation of the events and to a certain measure or degree the timing of these events. In the timing of such events, uh, Dr. Jung, uh, to use a trite expression, certainly goes out on the end of a limb. He reveals himself as believing certain things that to many persons are not only total mysteries, but totally unbelievable. And uh, because of its peculiar relationship to our interest, I'd like to read just a paragraph or two from his introduction, which will point out one of the situations that appears to me to be very interesting. On uh, page uh, 11 of the introductory section, introductory section, Dr. Jung writes, As we know from ancient Egyptian history, uh, we do go back slightly, he is now referring to certain events. These events are symptoms of psychic changes that always appear at the end of one platonic month and at the beginning of another. They are, it seems, changes in the constellation of psychic dominance of the archetypes or gods, as they used to be called, which bring about or accompany long-lasting transformations of the collective psyche. This transformation started within the historical tradition and left traces behind it, 
first in the transition from the age of Taurus to that of Aries, and then from Aries to Pisces, whose beginning coincides with the rise of Christianity. We are now nearing the great change which may be expected when the spring point, that is the vernal equinox, enters Aquarius. It would be frivolous of me to conceal from the reader that such reflections as these are not only exceedingly unpopular, but come perilously close to those turbid fantasies which becloud the minds of world improvers and other interpreters of signs and portents. But I must take this risk, even if it means putting my hard-won reputation for truthfulness, trustworthiness, and scientific judgment in jeopardy. I can assure my readers that I do not do this with a light heart. I think this is a very interesting quotation. Young is telling us, that the platonic year is a problem in timing and that what we call the precessional motion of the equinoxes results in the vernal equinox changing about every 2100 years and that these changes correspond to the months of the great platonic year which consists of something over 25,000 years. He is telling us, therefore, that these changes arising in nature, in cosmos, in space, are due to certain gradual transformations of archetypes, and that these archetypes mean that in nature this clock is active, and that this clock is continuously moving passing from one cyclic division to another, he could undoubtedly gather a powerful body of information to prove that at each of these vital periods, these periods in which the general dominant of the world changes, there has been a marked and important social psychological change in the life of individuals. First of all, however, the life of the individual is in uh, relationship to the life of the collective. That this phenomenon of the flying saucer should arise as the vernal equinox moves toward the Aquarian point, and that this consequently implies, as it did to the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans, and also to many Asiatic peoples, a major motion of world consciousness, world pressure, and that this motion is from a water sign to an air sign, and that therefore the atmospheric mystery, the mystery of air, and that which is concealed within air, must become increasingly psychologically dominant for a period of more than 2,000 years to come. Dr. Jung does not go into the detail of this interpretation, but for our purpose, let us proceed just a little further with it. The ancient Egyptian sign, later generally accepted, for the symbol of Aquarius are, uh, is two parallel lines of waves resembling a, a little, a double series of jagged lines. This symbol was the ancient Egyptian sign of water and was associated with their deity, Canopus, who was also a water deity. Also, however, this sign is not only a symbol of air, it is primarily a symbol of fluid or liquid in motion or movement. And as far back as the Egyptian period, the sign, though composed of water, was not regarded as a symbol of water as we know it. The Egyptians called it a symbol of the water of life. 
To them, it was an etheric, electric, or magnetic substance moving in the air. It was fluidic in nature, but energizing in quality. It represented the transmission of waves of energy in space. On this basis, dealing with an air sign with a curiously fluid symbol, almost resembling water. We may come into your magical and mystical concept, as referred to in the scripture, where it is declared that the waters which are above the firmament are divided from the waters which are beneath the firmament. The waters above the firmament have particular relationship to this symbol. And in Revelation, we behold the seer, John, raised up through the seven spheres and passing through the small door in heaven. Here he comes into the vision of a celestial region, in the midst of which stands the throne of the eternal. And before that throne is a sea like unto glass. This sea is the ancient Shemayim of the early Bible students. It was the sea of life, the sea of energy. It was a fluidic power, perhaps similar to the thinking of Dr. Steinmetz in his researches in electricity. This is force fluid. This is vital fluid. This is the mysterious brill of Lord bulwer lytons romances. This is universal energy made available to man. As the sign uh, to which the psychic content of archetype is moving at the present time bears upon this peculiar mystery, it is quite conceivable why an air sign should bring in an age of air. But it is also symbolic that it is not ordinary air. It is not the kind of air that blows upon our cheeks or fill the sails of our ships. It is not the kind of air that we simply obviously accept, the kind of air we think of as being better in the mountains. It is another kind of air. It is an air of life. It is a power moving in air. It is the symbol of an energy-filled space. And in the midst of this energy-filled space, we begin to experience two kinds of essentially recognizable phenomena. The first is man's conquest of physical space, calling upon the most recondite and subtle of all available energies. We begin to sense now perhaps the increasing psychic symbolism which has given us in the present century the aeroplane, television, radio, and now jet propulsion and the fission of atoms. All these things have to do with space time energies, and man has gradually become dominant in his consideration of these factors. This age of air conquest has also dramatically and emotionally affected our lives. It has changed the entire structure of our folklore. It has changed our legendary and our mythology. And as Dr. Jung points out, we are now standing in the presence of the creation of a world mythology, a mythology built upon an entirely new dimension of human experience. This is no longer the mythology of ancient gods rattling their spears. This is a mythology based upon the mystery of space itself. And out of this mythology comes gradually a series of space-time symbols. These symbols represented by such researchers as those of Dr. Rhine at Duke University. 
Here we have the problem of telepathy. We have the problem of mind reading. And gradually we are approaching the mystery of the prophetic spirit as a different dimension of consciousness. Here we are also confronted with man's physical researches into space as these are interpreted in folklore through the creation of such characters as Superman and the idea of the interplanetary voyages of Buck Rogers. These symbols cause young people growing up in the world today to have a peculiar orientation disorientation causing them to change their concept of the impossible and the miraculous. The wizard, like the mysterious Prospero of the Tempest, no longer draws circles or calls forth Caliban from the earth. The old magician, with his black starred robe and peaked cap, is no longer with us. In his place, however, stands the magician symbol, unchanged, because it represents mystery. But whether they like it or not, whether they want it or not, uh, whether they are willing to accept it or not, the ancient robe of stars, the magician's wand, and the strange ceremonial equipment of ancient sorcery has now been bestowed as a priceless heritage to have and to hold upon the body of modern science. Science is the new magician. Science is the new magic. It has all the apparent requirements for this because, first of all, actually, factually, basically, science is a mystery. It is not only a mystery to the layman, it is a mystery also to the scientist. It is more mysterious to the degree that he knows more. For his search for certitudes is not, up to the present time, rewarded with any final conclusions. The further he explores the great fields of world energy, the more completely he recognizes the incredible area of his search. His own rationality extends as far as it can, but finally also is swallowed up in common mystery. It depends to some degree how far his mind has been tutored, how far his reason can go before it is overwhelmed. Thus we have a series of psychological factors, factors which reveal to us inevitable motion, growth if you wish to call it, change if you prefer, evolution if you like it better, but progressive inevitable change in the psychic dominance which lie behind individual and collective conduct. This brings us then to the next important factor of our problem. Carl Jung is convinced that there is great work yet necessary in determining what constitutes a challenge to the subconscious and, in, and unconscious element in man himself. Up to the present time, we have generally thought of psychic experience as a rather personal, individual thing. We have talked about and mentioned folk consciousness, but up to the present time, we have far from exhausted the symbolism of this important subject. Jung, following a good many other researchers in the field, and he indicates from his various source materials quoted in this work, that he is fairly well acquainted with the literature on all sides of the question. Jung approaches the problem as to what might cause a collective attitude on a mystery. We have generally assumed that mysteries 
differ with the individual interpreting power. What is mysterious to one person is not mysterious to another. What creates psychic tension in one does not create psychic tension in others. Yet we know that psychic tension is caused. We know that the individual comes under certain pressures and that these pressures ultimately affect his life. As a result of these pressures, he develops fears. He develops defenses. He may be forced into a frustration. And if the pressure is sufficient, he may become powerfully neurotic. Up to now, we have been thinking of these neuroses in the terms of our unfriendly and misunderstanding relatives. We have been thinking of them in terms of bad breaks and hard luck. Or if we were a little more thoughtful, we may have added a factor of personal carelessness concerning responsibility. That the individual gains a tremendous psychic overload of negative factors simply by living beyond his means, by being extravagant or intemperate, or breaking certain basic laws of consequences which are ever present in society. We have not, however, conceived the point now under consideration, and that is that the collective situation of mankind may result in a collective psychic pressure. And because this psychic pressure is of a certain type or kind, it may result in mass reaction of individual psyches. In other words, there are private problems which we must solve as private citizens but there are also collective problems to which we react collectively. And this collectivity is to Dr. Jung an important key to something. This collectivity, in our case, depends somewhat upon the general situation of the world in which we live, just as surely as we may have an unpleasant domestic situation or children who give us unusual problems. So as a collective group, we are now under a series of collective pressures. These pressures, for example, can represent what uh, Dr. Young points out as world cleavage at the moment. The world psychologically breaking up the world psychologically dividing. Division is always a cause of apprehension in the natural life of man because it means confusion, and confusion presents problems on various levels. And in almost every instance, confusion is overpowering to groups of persons. Our confusion today uh, may arise from the continual emphasis upon the division of our world into democratic and socialistic states. The increasing psychic pressure of the conflict between communism and democracy is no longer a pressure affecting a few. It is a pressure affecting practically every human being with the possible exception of a few outlying uh, fringes of primitive life, not yet affected, but ultimately to be affected. Thus we have not a problem that is of primary concern to one nation, one social level, or one culture group. We have a problem that is resulting in almost identical anxieties involving practically the entire population of the earth. Thus we have a tremendous mass pressure. Another great mass pressure is our economic state. Most persons are not happy concerning it. They regard it as dangerous. They regard the piling up and monumenting of debt 
as dangerous. They consider it very possible that around some corner lies a terrible period of recompense for the audacious extravagance of modern man. The average person is not secure in his economic life. He may be at the moment curiously abundant, but even this is a cause of fear. Anxiety, therefore, on an economic level is tremendously widespread. And the intricate development of the elements and factors necessary to perpetuate this economic prosperity, this machinery seems so delicate that it might easily go out of gear at almost any moment. Another grave and doubtful problem which burdens most mortals today is war. War which has become no longer a problem of participants and spectators, but now of total participation. The danger of this hanging over the family, over the individual, constitutes world pressure. Thus, instead of an isolated person here and there coming under a psychic tension, or perhaps in the face of the enlarging evidence that even in our own country, where actually we have some of the strongest defenses against the common meaning of mystery, even here, more than 50% of our people is suffering from some form of psychic stress tension. Most of these persons to a degree in which it is endangering the normal expression of their lives and the proper relationships between themselves and others. Dr. Jung points out, therefore, that almost identical stimuli are now affecting vast groups of persons. And he also points out that this is the proper and natural cause for what might be termed mass hysteria. Now, mass hysteria does not mean uh, that the flying saucers are necessarily the product of imagination. It does mean, however, that the interpretation of these various mysterious phenomena indicate or reveal the presence of mass hysteria in man. This is something that we have also discussed previously on other levels, and the idea I do not think is essentially new, but it is pressed upon the scientific world by Dr. Jung's flat statements, which of course will be rejected by many, but will be given some heed and thought by a cautious and thoughtful few, as he himself suggests. The presence of mass hysteria arising from common causes means that we now have hundreds of millions of persons under tension from identically the same type of pressure. It is no longer a problem in which the pressure itself is highly specialized. In the individual, these pressures are specialized. The individual, uh, in his personal relationships with others, is under pressure because of the peculiar conduct of an individual or of a small number of individuals. Therefore, his reaction is highly individual. And another man in the same block, under pressure, will react differently because his personal pressures are of a different nature. But beneath these personal pressures, which cause an infinite variety of reactions, there are these mass or archetypal pressures, which are of tremendous intensity, and to which man must respond with the most powerful archetypal mechanisms which he himself possesses. 
these archetypal mechanisms may be more similar than we realize. For while man is outwardly divided by numerous interests and activities and conditionings, and his various levels of living have a profound effect upon his personal conduct, archetypal pressures, like atavistic pressures, may be astonishingly consistent and in general conformity. This means that while we may react differently to the things that happen to us as persons, we may react with amazing similarity to things which happen subjectively or archetypally to vast groups. Man reacting, in turn, must react from himself. He reacts in terms of his own conscience, in terms of his own tradition, and in terms of his own experience. Yet in the great values of living, man's experience reactions are also astonishingly consistent. While we may think we are highly individual, and we may say, I have made up my mind that I have reached a decision that no one else ever arrived at, the truth is that he has arrived at a decision which hundreds of millions of other persons have arrived at, at some time in the vast course of human experience. Nor must we be confused or deceived by the idea that we live in such peculiar times that our experiences could never have happened before. The symbolism, the detail, the level of scientific or mechanical knowledge, these have changed. But the individual is like Shylock in The Merchant of Venice from beginning to the end of his history. If you pinch him, it hurts. It doesn't make any difference how wise or how foolish he is. If you cut him, he bleeds. If you shoot him or stab him, he dies. And these things are unchanging in the experience of man, regardless of his methods for achieving these particular hazards or, or being confronted with these special dangers. Dr. Young then points out that against this general situation, we also have a general archetypal defense mechanism gradually building within us. The long existing conflict between our religious ideologies and our scientific or rationalistic thinking also presents itself for our attention at this time. Man has be believed from the beginning of his existence that in some way his very survival is involved in miraculous circumstances. Religion has long given him the feeling that behind and beneath his own activity there is some kind of a universal purpose ruled over by universal intelligence. In the last 500 years particularly, Man's interpretation of religious mystery has changed. His increasing knowledge of the world around him has given him experience factors with which to work that were not previously available to him. And experience versus tradition ultimately results in the victory of experience. For that which is known, felt, and seen gradually gains authority over the unseen and the unknown, regardless of what these factors may be. Thus, the problem of divine intercession, the intercession of a good spiritual principle, or of divine punishment, the intercession of a divine retributional agency, these have moved from a theological level of the uh, actual anthropomorphism of our ancestors, God and devil fighting for the soul of man, 
and have these things have moved into a neo, sometimes pseudo, scientific relationship to life. In other words, we are now looking toward the universe for a scientific explanation of our religion. We are demanding more and more a lawful universe, nor can we reject the evidence is beyond denial of the tremendous potential of power and energy surrounding us in life. Carl Jung brings these elements as indicative of a natural defensive armament, man in the pressure of collective problem, seeks for individual security. But he has no way in these mysteries, which are beyond his normal rational comprehension, he has no way to secure this confidence, this support, or this encouragement, except by falling into the interior archetypal patterns of himself. And in these archetypal patterns, he falls back into his basic convictions and to the astonishment of himself and perhaps others, he discovers that these basic convictions are not as unique or individual as he thought. He now realizes, for instance, that the basic conviction of the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Christian, and the Jew are not so different. These convictions have to do with the same basic ethical values in the universe. Realizing this, it is natural that he should cause to rise within himself certain symbolic factors. These symbolic factors combining his own psychic experience and to a degree the projection of this experience through wish fulfillment. We then have a very natural and proper situation created for a strange reaction, a reaction, however, which is not unreasonable, a reaction which in terms of the circumstances is inevitable, because all circumstances must ultimately lead to inevitable consistent reactions. In the face of this, we have experienced a number of interesting and remarkable historical records. We can go back, of course, to the tremendous mass spiritual reaction which dominated the medieval, medieval period. We know the tremendous effect psychologically upon man of the rise of demonology and witchcraft during the Dark Ages. We know the tremendous repentance of man in the medieval period in which these vast uh, parades of penitence moved about Europe in the terms of hundreds of thousands, fearfully flagellating themselves because they believed that the day of judgment was at hand. And the thing that made it all very important was that they knew as individuals that they were wrong. Wrong in the sense that they had lived badly, that their consciences were not clean, and that any retribution that suited the offense must be heavy and terrible. Thus recognizing themselves to be seriously at fault, they were unable to conceive archetypally or symbolically of a just universe in which they would not be punished. Against this punishment was the teaching, the belief within themselves also, of the essential parenthood of deity, and that therefore, as children of deity, they might secure intercession or hope for salvation through repentance. And because repentance constituted an essential part of their religious belief, 
they made every possible mass and collective effort to merit this repentance. And this tremendous mass motion, though it did not affect the whole world as the present situation does, is also expressed in the uh, symbolic and prophetic writings of Leonardo da Vinci, in which uh, the portents of a great world destruction due to the sins and evil of mankind might reasonably or naturally be expected. Times again have in many ways changed. Man is no longer convinced of the absolute supremacy of these ethical convictions or moral beliefs that dominated his ancestors. Therefore, in line with his present mentality, in line with his present emotional need or pressure, and in line with the achievements in the educational levels of science, particularly in physics, astronomy, and electronics, the individual is transforming his symbolism into those things or departments or avenues which appear reasonable or likely to himself. He discovers, to his own amazement perhaps, that he is just as capable of myth-making as his ancestors. But it is a different kind of myth. The myth that is thrown at him through television. The myth of scientific discovery and pseudo-scientific fiction. And this pseudo-scientific fiction is taking place, taking the place of Grimm's fairy tales. It is taking the place of the wonderful adventures of Sindad the Sailor. It is taking the place of Sleeping Beauty. It is taking the place of Cinderella. These belong to a different psychic life. Today, man reaching out with his myth-making potential, is building his myths around his own psychic experience. Now all this might sound as though Dr. Jung is convinced that the entire subject is myth-making, that he has created the entire situation. Actually, Dr. Jung is not so convinced. He is convinced, however, that man, in the presence of mystery, of something which he cannot fully rationalize, has suddenly and dramatically revealed or exposed, perhaps almost prematurely, the myth-making mechanism which is within his own nature. That this myth-making mechanism carries with it a strange mixture of religious and scientific elements, that it carries something of the miraculous which science would in be inclined to deny. It also carries something of the scientific interpretation of religion, which many theologians would deny. Our story then reveals changes within the archetypal psyche, collective and individual, the individual always existing within a collective, against the pressure of which he has not absolute immunity, only degrees of immunity, according to the development of his own interior personal potential. In this level of thinking, we will assume that something moves across the heavens. This something is for the most part described as a spherical or plate-like disk. This disk has been seen. There are records of it having been seen hundreds of years ago. Jung points this out. But he also points out that the whirling disk is not only a scientific symbol, but one of the oldest religious symbols of mankind, something we are inclined to 
overlook. In Indian mythology, in the wonderful story of the Bhagavad Gita, the deity Vishnu tells Arjuna, the prince of men, that when virtue fails upon the earth, I will come forth. Among the basic symbols of Vishnu, always carried by this deity in one of his several arms, is the chakra or the whirling disc. This whirling disc is also the Buddhist and Tibetan mandala or mandara, the symbol of whirling motion. And most of all, in all mythologies, the symbol of totality, of unity and of completeness. The appearance of the chakra or whirling disc would be difficult to explain consciously to Western man, even as it would be difficult to explain the whirling swastika-like hammer of the, of the Nordic deity Thor, the hammer which thrown vast distances, performs its mission, and then whirls back like a boomerang to be captured again by the deity of power who wields it. Here also is the mysterious many-legged symbol, like a swastika. Uh, associated in English heraldry with the Isle of Man, and also in Southern European heraldry with the, the ancient state of the two Sicilies. Here we have a mysterious whirling symbol, a symbol which has from the beginning of time archetypally been employed in religion. There are many other examples of this same type of symbolic figure. It appears in vestments. It appears in various uh, religious art, both Christian and non-Christian. Most of all, however, it is a subconscious power symbol. And it is also unconsciously or subconsciously in man a symbol of the presence of a power superior to man, and likened in the Indic mysteries to Vishnu. Now, Vishnu is the preserver. He is a symbol of the protection of man against the inevitability of absolute law without mercy. He is the intercessor. He is a presence of messianic significance. In Buddhism throughout ancient times, the belief in the advent of a new power of benevolence in the form of the celestial bodhisattva Maitreya has been recognized. In the last 50 years throughout the Mahayana areas of Asia, where this type of Buddhism dominates, legends have been gathering that this deity was to come again and would come soon for the salvation of his people. That this Maitreya principle or symbol is also, therefore, the symbol of a deity coming in glory for the salvation of his people. Now, it would appear that we might have a series of rather complex symbolisms here, and we have. The actual basis of it all probably still evades discovery or eludes us. But we do know that the whirling wheel, whether it Buddha's wheel of the law or the mysterious whirling wheels within wheels of Ezekiel's vision, has a particular and special meaning. A few years ago, the Republic of India selected the chakra which is the spinning wheel, the whirling wheel, the mandala, the mysterious instrument weapon of Vishnu, accepted this as the official symbol of their nation. This symbol of the wheel is the symbol of law, of motion, of change, of order. 
And for some reason, which is perhaps obvious and perhaps not obvious, uh, this has become closely identified with the flying saucer problem. There, of course, have been reports of other shapes, but overwhelmingly the luminous self-moving wheel has been uh, the most commonly reported form. This is an archetypal symbol. It is a symbol of both hope and repentance. It is a symbol of the divine intercession in a muddle which no man can find a cure. It is the final problem of the child, having exhausted every resource of its own, has finally dumped the problem in the parental lap. There seems to be no other answer. And the individual has been moved to do this. But psychologically and culturally and educationally, he is no longer able to dump this problem into the lap of a personification like that of deity on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. He is unable any longer to put this problem in the hands of an old gentleman. Yet he needs that old gentleman desperately. His need for that power has not changed. But his own mental and intellectual reactions have changed. Therefore, a substitution takes place. And substitutions of this kind are common in the history of religion for we know that religion has evolved. Man has outgrown at one time the belief that the world was governed only by the ghosts of the dead and evil spirits. He gradually brought forth a universe of benevolent divine leadership. And he is still desperately in need of that divine leadership. And the fact that he has subconsciously selected a new type of symbolism does not in any way indicate that he has lost faith in God or lost his basic theological instinct. It merely means that in the clothing of abstraction he must use such instruments as he possesses. And under the present system, a hundred years from now, our children's children and their children will possess scientific instruments essentially. And with these scientific instruments, they must interpret their religion. Their religion will not depart from them, but it will develop a new folklore in which certain universal discoveries will take the place of beliefs. But these discoveries will be as essentially sacred, essentially divine, and as essentially religious as any that we know. And the, and the basic instinct of man to believe his need for spiritual consolation and his absolute dependence upon the acceptance of a universal principle superior to himself. These necessities are clearly emphasized in practically all modern psychic symbolism. And these necessities do not change. Man does not become archetypally materialistic. He merely shifts his symbolism into forms that are more consistent with the rational equipment which he has developed. But his basic need of mystery remains unchanged. His basic need for adjustment to mystery goes on forever. And the search for the adjustment to mystery is finally the search for the way that leads to God or to the spiritual overtone of life. This search, moving in upon hundreds of millions of persons, uh, probably nearly 200 million devout Russians, who are the victim of a dominant political party, a party, however, which has found that it cannot destroy their religion, because this religion is archetypal, and the only thing that materialism can ever do 
is finally become another instrument for religion. It cannot escape this inevitable, imponderable in man. To then come directly into the problem of our flying saucer phenomena, we have several things. The nature of the object, its real purpose and function, may be known soon or it may not be known at all. Dr. Young does not attempt uh, to express any final conclusion about it. He does point out, however, that there are sufficient indications in the psychic thinking of man that at least a large part of the so-called interpretation of the unknown flying objects, that this interpretation reveals man's present state of consciousness reveals the basic problems which burden him and reveals in one way or another certain positive solutional procedures. He does not say that everyone who thinks he sees or who believes he sees or insists that he knows that he sees a flying saucer, that this person is self-deluded. Jung does not say that. He does say, however, that this person, under the pressure of an unknown circumstance, either real or imagined, and actually there is very little difference in the terms of the psychic urgency, that he reacts instantly to that which he himself is able to contribute to the interpretation of this type of object. Today, therefore, as Jung points out, there is a reasonable conformity of general opinion about flying saucers. It is sharply divided into the believers and the non-believers. But in general substance, the basic conclusions of both groups may be said to be founded upon a similar structure of evidence. Uh, whether it is tangible or intangible. Now Dr. Young brings up another important question, which I think he could have carried a little further than he did. But then again, it is his book, and he has a right to go as far as he thinks is best. We have mentioned here, uh, not long ago, in one of the morning discussions, the possibility of certain types of phenomena, mental phenomena, in which two or more persons may have identical psychic experiences. Jung brings this out as presenting a very great problem. Whether this problem is as real as Dr. Jung assumes, um, I am not going to say, but I suspect that it is merely need for further research. The Rhine's experiments at Duke would definitely indicate the power of telepathic communication, that various circumstances and incidents and under some conditions visual phenomena may be transferred from one person to another. This is particularly true where persons are peculiarly sympathetic or, as in the case of extremely sensitive individuals, have extraordinary receptive power of precipitation and visualization. If it is conceivable that a thought can move from one mind to another and in that other mind take on some visual form, as in the case of the various card delineations, in which squares, circles, triangles, and stars can be telepathically communicated as forms. If this is possible, we are in the presence of a very interesting circumstance. One person 
passing on a form of this kind to another is an interesting, curious phenomenon in itself. But it tells us much more. It tells us that such a power does exist. And furthermore, that by faculties and powers within man himself, a form can be projected from one mind to another. Yet this projection is based upon the communication of a thought. There is not, it is not the card that is passed from one person to another, but the likeness or similitude of that card interiorly visualized. If this be true, what is our next thought? If an individual possesses power to do this, the success of the experiment depends upon two things. First, the adequate power of the projecting mind. And the second is the adequate receptive power of the receiving mind. If these two elements are adequate, the transmission of form, idea, or sound may be accomplished. Let us suppose, for example, that artificial means were used by means of which the power of the projecting mind was amplified. Let us say that it was hitched to some kind of a machine in which its energies would become greatly intensified. Under normal conditions, we would expect this to result in a clearer communication, a more immediate one, and most important of all, that this communication, because of its increasing intensity, would be received by persons less sensitive. Therefore, the intensity of the communicating power would make the object or subject of communication uh, conveyable to more persons. Knowing that we are dealing with some kind of a mental projecting energy, we come right back to one of the earliest teachings of religion, held also commonly by many philosophical and even neoscientific groups. For example, today in our churches, uh, the collective prayer for the sick in which the congregation is asked to send its thought, its love, and its healing good wishes to a sick member of the congregation with the full belief that where two or more are gathered, that a projection of power, which may seem to the uninitiated to be miraculous, is supported or sustained by the increasing number of persons supplying energy. Let us now take this and change it once more. Let us take a natural interior projection image, arising archetypally, like the mysterious whirling wheel of Vishnu. And let us assume that in the course of a few years, this concept, this projection idea is no longer in the keeping of one person or 50 persons or 500 persons, that like the problem with which we are faced, this projection is now held as a visually valid thing by hundreds of millions of persons. What will this do to the intensification of the thought form? Would this result in a tremendous increase of common visualization? Is psychic communication under these conditions broadening out to include many persons previously not sensitive? The, the Jung brings up the problem as to whether this could be true. He does not expand it as far as I have just done, but he does intimate that under conditions it is a known phenomenon that several persons simultaneously have visualized the same thing 
without being in common conscious unity. They were not expecting, they did not know what the other person was going to see, but they have had common visualization. This common visualization certainly implies a dimension of energy, a dimension of power with which we are not at the present time commonly acquainted. Nor is it impossible to say that such visualization may remain completely um, within the realm of things inwardly seen or perceived. If communication by telepathy or by any other means is an actual transference of energy or a communication by energy, whether visible or invisible, whether orthodox or unorthodox. And this energy is built up by the tremendous coordinated agreement of many persons, an agreement which is just as much strengthened by fear as it is by faith, an intensity arising from acceptance, either positive or negative, Negative acceptance being your fear acceptance. But interior visualization of the reality of this intangible, if such is the case, will this common archetypal thought form produced by man, held to be real by man, placed in certain localities and time patterns by man, is it conceivable? that this thought intensity could actually affect radar? That is one of the questions. Is it possible for an instrument to pick up a mass concept? And is it possible for this instrument uh, to recognize this mass concept in a local condition or area? Once the archetype has been built up, where is it? Is this archetype now part of the mystery of this space dimension that we refer to as the Aquarian Age? Is it conceivable, therefore, that this archetype can develop certain energy potentials within itself and result in a compound phenomenon? This is another department of thought. I believe that Dr. Young's primary concept is that such an archetype can be built up, but that it is essentially an interior archetype, and that if it appears outwardly, it is projected from within the individual or the folk collective. Contrary to this thinking, he therefore uh, appears to assume that this archetype is projected upon an unknown object. Rather than to affirm at this stage, at least, that the archetype is the object, he implies that the archetype is projected upon an object or a circumstance unexplainable. And this is, to a measure at least, his compromise between the reality of the flying saucer and the concept that it is only a myth. He is inclined to assume, therefore, that something definitely exists there, but that this something is like a burnished metal mirror in which man sees his own face reflected. The mirror exists. But man, hypnotized by his own reflection in it, does not analyze the substance of the mirror. He analyzes only his own likeness in that mirror. The nature of the phenomena, therefore, into which all this is measured or reflected or mirrored, may be of a contrary type or kind to that generally believed. It may have an entirely different explanation as yet entirely unrecognized. But this again has to do with mechanical situations. 
the projection of man relating to this has to do with the survival of his own ethics. It also has to do with the survival of his sanity and the survival of his world as a great ethical institution. Thus, the primary interest lies in the circumstance of the diagnosing of this almost instinctive reaction, uh, which, of course, reminds us of the highly intensified reaction to the famous story of the invasion from Mars in the uh, television broadcast by Orson Welles. This, uh, although the program was interrupted frequently to assure the viewer that it was a fictional story, caused a comparative panic by those who refused to accept the fact that it was fiction. Thus the individual, once his orientations are shaken, especially by visual phenomena, loses the sense of his own integration and falls back into his natural pattern of fears, anxieties, and doubts. Jung pointing this out indicates one abstraction, which again he does not carry to its, seems to me, its logical extreme, but certainly something can be derived from the concept. Namely, the final proof of man's own integration lies in the fact that his imagination will reveal to him nothing but good. This is the final integration. The final integration of man is that he may accept mystery without fear on all levels of existence. That the unknown no longer carries anxiety. Actually, when the unknown no longer carries anxiety, man is then religious. Because theoretically, at least, the unknown cause of things must be God. And God cannot be a cause of anxiety to man unless man is wrong. This is the basic concept. The tremendous increasing anxiety, as recognized politically, economically, industrially, and psychologically, indicates, therefore, that man, is in the immediate need of better and newer experiences of good. Now, in the interpretation of flying saucer phenomena, we run across a number of diversified accounts. Uh, some opinions are to the effect that we are being surveyed for possible invasion, that out of space some type of creature is going to arrive uh, some are said to have arrived, measuring in size from about 20 inches up to about 20 feet. Some of them resemble human beings. Some seem to be highly intellectualized octopi. But whatever they may be, they are supposed to be out looking us over. Now, what does man inevitably do? He measures instinctively and archetypally and comes up subconsciously with one of the most just thoughts he has ever had. Namely, if someone is looking us over, they are not going to see much. <laughs> this is uh, a, a very uh, common thought. Also, if people from somewhere else are looking for a better world, this is not it. So there is one school of thought that insists that after taking a look around, uh, these various recognizance flights depart to their own cause, deciding to wait a while or to uh, give humanity additional millennia in which to ripen. There is this thought. Another group, dominated with a somewhat more uh, fearful uh, interpretation, suggests that perhaps some of our recent scientific experiments are known to those on other planets or stars and that it looks so much as though they were going, we were going to blow ourselves up and perhaps them also 
that it might be wise to take a look around and see what could be done to prevent the common disaster. This is actually man's natural, subjective, archetypal thinking under an emergency. He therefore assumes that the occupant of the mysterious interspace vehicle has a mind like his, is reacting approximately as he reacts, and that, as in the case of ancient mythology, gods are men plus that they have very much the same natures and constitutions, but they have more authority and power with which to do something about it, more intelligence, more native understanding, but of a kind similar to our own. Then there is another group that is quite convinced that on this mysterious aerial tramway, we are going to be reached by beings of superior intelligence. And the reason we know that they are going to be superior is because they are going to be peaceful. Do you see the psychological content in our own thinking there? At the moment, our idea of superiority is arbitration of dispute without war. That is a goal. That is something we have not attained, but something we believe that an ex-superior may have attained, a deity or a power that this power, whatever it is, appearing out of space, comes this time not with a sword, but with peace. Therefore, that the purpose is essentially to assist us. Here we have a more valid statement of man's natural theological insight. Various explanations are therefore largely in terms of our present psychic pressure. The physical problems, the rationalistic problem of interplanetary or interstellar communication is still in its infancy. We have no way of explaining rationally how some of these things could be accomplished. But we are moving gradually and inevitably toward scientific achievement as represented by the Sputnik and by other things and have reached that state of scientific disorientation, as far as the popular mind is concerned, in which anything is possible. Therefore, the boundaries of mental conservatism have been removed, and we live in a world of pure fantasy on these subjects. And this pure fantasy, without censorship, gives us a tremendous release of ourselves without censorship throws us directly upon our own resources, tells us whether subconsciously we love or fear life, subconsciously whether we believe in truth or do not, whether we accept a rational, lawful universe or we do not. Also, in the development of this concept, we gain some insight into our concept of creatures unlike ourselves and show to what degree our imagination precipitates ideal types or subversive types in nature. For our practical purposes, therefore, the story of the flying saucer becomes a tremendous psychological testing. It is a new kind of test. It is a test that out rushocks the rushock test. It is a test in which man is no longer asked to put square pegs in round holes or is not expected uh, to look at pen blots and try to read them. Yet, the mysterious dot floating in the sky is a kind of pen blot. It is a kind of mystery in which man must read something, and all he can ever read into anything is himself. Thus, the entire pattern can be regarded almost as a complete Freudian mystery. Freudian in the sense that just as we interpret a dream as having certain psychological meaning, so all of man's attitudes toward the unknown and his efforts to visualize the unknown in fantasy 
these uh, processes will result in a kind of dream. A dream about his own inner life. No longer merely a personal life in every instance, because the dream moves back into archetype and reveals needs, pressures, and collective problems. But that this dream is capable of analysis, and that in the analysis of it, we gain far more about insight into man, life, nature, and being than we gain by attempting to solve the actual mechanical mystery of the sources. That what we are really dealing with is a, is a crisis, a crisis in the great platonic year, a crisis in which man, moving from one pattern of archetype symbolism to another, is confronted with an entirely new way of life, a way of life which is in his own archetype, but is not in the persona or outer conscious self. And the relationship of archetype impelling and impressing itself upon self, upon the objective person, results in bewilderment and confusion. Until this bewilderment is arbitrated and this confusion solved by the integration of the two parts of man's own nature or the establishment of an interior totality. This interior totality is announced as mysteries are announced by the appearance of the peculiar symbol of the deity of totality, by the rising in man's consciousness of the sense of this great whirling wheel, which into a measure at least is the wheel of fortune the wheel of life, the mysterious cyclic symbol of the great platonic ear also, the concept of man moving to the wheel position in his own integration, the wheel position being evolutionary, being in itself unfolding of motion of great cyclic patterns and plans, and the immediate presence of the evidence necessary to restore man's faith in a universe of cosmic law and order, of motion under law and in law, and the motion itself, the very energy with which man is attempting to solve the various political, social, economic problems of his time. The wheel has been the symbol of industry since the dawn of time. The wheel has been the symbol of transportation and to a measure of communication. The wheel is one of the most common symbols in our daily life, taking us from one place to another. And the wheel symbol is therefore an appropriate emblem of translation, of transportation or motion from a state to a state. And the individual's acceptance of that means to a measure his immediate adjustment with progress. Thus the actual problem of the saucer naturally is not within the, the realm of psychology. It would have to be held to be in the realm of physical sciences. It is not in the realm of religion primarily or of philosophy in general. But what it does to the individual or what it reveals from the individual, these are of the greatest possible utility in the integration and organization of human progress. Therefore, through looking into this mysterious mirror, we behold signs and symbols and portents in the heavens. And we know that these symbol signs and portents awaken in man certain reactions from himself. And that from these reactions, we can determine a measure of his adjustment or lack of such adjustment. And from these reactions, we may help to steer the course of future education, future religion and philosophy, and future therapy and psychology, in order that these departments of human help may be geared more intimately to the basic, fundamental, inevitable, archetypal requirements of man. 
And when we are able to accomplish that, we shall then have found that like everything else in nature, things visible are symbols of principles which must be understood. This, I believe, is the primary message which Dr. Jung has for us in his book. Now I'd like to make two or three announcements which I trust you will uh, take notice of. This afternoon at two o'clock here in this room, we are going to have a short memorial service for Mr. Paul Falk, who passed on several weeks ago. Those who were his friends and knew him would like to join with us in this little uh, testimonial to our long friendship and acquaintance. Uh, all are most cordially invited to be here. I'd like to also call attention to the fact that my own lectures here will begin again the second Sunday in October, that is October 11th. In the meantime, I will be in San Francisco and Denver. And if you have friends in either of these communities, we would be very happy if you would leave their names and addresses and we will send them programs. Also, we will be very glad to have your names and addresses for our mailing list if you are not already receiving our programs. During the month of September, in which we will not be here, there will be two regular activities here at headquarters. Uh, on September, beginning on September 5th, and on Saturday afternoons at 3.15 p.m., beginning September 5th and extending through October 3rd, Mr. Ernest Burmester will continue his courses of lectures. Uh, the subject for this series, uh, uh, the opening subject at least, is telepathy as a means of communication. That, I think, would be uh, right in line. I know his thinking on these subjects and I'm sure that uh, he will give some very interesting factors relating to the idea of communication which we discussed this morning. Uh, these uh, lectures will be given in our classroom, and we hope that you will pick up a piece of publicity or communicate uh, with our staff so that you may know about Mr. Burmester's work. Uh, beginning next Sunday morning, and for four Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock, Dr. Framrose A. Bode will speak at 11 o'clock here in our room, here in the auditorium, beginning uh, next Sunday morning for four Sundays, and his first subject on September 6th will be, What is the Soul? We hope that many of you will be interested in his work. As you know, both Dr. Bode and Mr. Burmester are members of our staff and uh, our concern with our way of life and the things that we believe are essential and valuable. And we hope that you will attend these good activities and that you will tell your friends about them. Uh, Mr. Burmester, beginning on Saturday afternoon, uh, September 5th at 3.15, and Dr. Bode beginning on September 6th at 11 o'clock. So we hope that you will tell your friends and let them know about this activity. Now, as we will not be with you for a few weeks, we hope that you will take up this opportunity to do some specialized reading and will therefore visit our book tables and supply yourself with your late summer literature. We believe that uh, this will be of value and help and also through the, supporting, uh, through the support given by our book sales, we are able to continue this work and of course, we at the present time are in special need of all the help you can give us with this heavy building program on our hands. So we hope you will visit the book table. We have some used books for your consideration and that you will uh, subscribe to our magazine and will let us have the names of your friends in Denver or San Francisco who might like to attend our lectures. And in the meantime, until I see you again in October, on October 11th, just uh, be happy, be good, and God bless you.